thing I wanted to say is if, um, you know, if your reaction after hearing that um, they would be hosting a presidential candidate, if your reaction was, you know, fuck off. Um, My reaction was, fuck yeah! Uh, okay, if it was fuck off, I'd say, like, I think we're gonna do just fine. Uh, I certainly, me personally, I'm very little interest in, uh, you know, going to be, uh, to an event to have somebody speak at me. Um, and, uh, I guess the question next is, what the fuck's this guy okay. doing here? And, uh, we'll get to that, I guess. Um, just a little bit about myself, I'll keep this really brief, because, I'm not that important, and uh, ultimately I think we want to get to what is really important, and that's all of you. Um, so again, my name is Beanie Saltisic, I'm the presidential candidate for the Socialist Party USA. Um, I live in Los Angeles, but I'm originally from uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, which is uh, just a bit outside of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up a skateboarding punk rock kid. Yeah. As a young kid, I got in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble with the law. and. Uh, from uh, high school, I became uh, a musician from 17 to 32. Still got in a lot of trouble. I also developed some pretty uh, healthy substance abuse habits. And I think uh, by the time I was in my early 30s, um, you know, my health started to fail. Uh, and I got to a spot where I realized that I basically had two choices to make. One is I continue on the path that I'm on. And at this moment, of course, uh, I cared about very little. I didn't care about anybody else, and I certainly didn't care about myself. Um, or I start to try to figure out what it's like to be alive and um, actually consider a future. Uh, I chose that second option. Um, it wasn't easy. I found out quickly that I had uh, forgotten how to learn, uh, which was a kind of a pretty profound realization. Uh, and I also realized that I was completely disconnected from any idea of community. Uh, I was not a good listener. And I started to try to put little baby steps, one foot in front of the other, and kind of try to rebuild uh, my life, clear my head a little bit. As I started to clear my head, um, I started to learn how to listen again. And in listening, I um, started to hear what the folks in my community were saying, uh, hearing their voices, hearing their stories, and uh, I, I, I'm not lying to you when I uh, found that I was in a spot where I would cry rather easily, um, having felt so disconnected for so long, and really being blind to uh, what life was like for so many people, uh, it, it hit me very hard. Um, at this point, I wouldn't say that I was a radical. Um, I was just uh, trying to figure out life. But eventually, some folks and I decided in Los Angeles that maybe we might try to do some community outreach work. Uh, so we started to do things like bicycle drives for children in South Los Angeles, uh, clothing drives for survivors of human trafficking. And as we're doing this work, uh, what we're hearing from the staffs at these nonprofit organizations is that these problems, uh, that the nonprofit work was sort of like trying to cure cancer with a band-aid. That while the services are essential, uh, there is always a line of clients in need of service. They get their service, they leave, <coughs> but that revolving door of clients is nonstop, you know? And I began to wonder, and again, you know, coming from the place where I was trying to put together these learning building blocks, uh, trying to recognize, like, well, what is the cancer, you know? And as I'm learning, uh, eventually it came to socialism. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you come to this spot where you're learning about socialism, quickly you realize and, and uh, you know, you're taught that that cancer is capitalism. It's a system, you know? And that these prophylactic measures, these topical measures to treating that cancer, uh, they don't make a dent in that overall suffering, you know. Uh, and generally, our political leaders, our candidates, etc., they're going to talk to you about reforms to the problem, and uh, which basically kicks the can down the road. And as I'll explain a little bit later. Capitalism, the cancer, it actually needs those reforms in order uh, to survive, in order to grow, and to become even more insidious, you know? Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, uh, I was able to identify, as many have, as many folks in this room have, that that cancer is a system. It's capitalism. And also to be able to identify what's the antidote, what's the solution to that system. Well, that's socialism, right? Uh, so I asked around. I wondered. I had felt like I had so much catching up to do because so much of my life had been spent uh, focused on self-destruction. I wondered, like, where does somebody like me go who uh, kind of wants to put that energy and their effort into something positive and something that addresses that cancer? So I talked to a lot of folks, did my research, and uh, eventually I came across the Socialist Party, and I saw quickly that there were a bunch of tattooed folks like me, and there were a bunch of folks who kind of have very similar sort of stories. And, um, you know, I joined and really hit the ground running, and um, it was a really bizarre experience, and I think in many ways it felt like maybe a baby taking a first breath to get into an environment where uh, democratic participation is the expectation, and realizing that you know our institutions, our families, our workplaces, our education, etc., um, they're not set up for democratic participation. You know, and uh, initially I found that I didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I have no experience in uh, feeling a sense of value and being in an environment where people want to hear my voice, want to hear my ideas, and that sort of thing. But I also quickly felt that once you uh, find your way to that kind of environment, it becomes very difficult uh, to return back to those institutions, the workplaces, the schools, families, etc., without feeling that something is incredibly wrong, you know? Uh, so, you know, I really just hit that with a lot of passion and intensity. And last year, uh, me feeling, you know, for, for, some, for quite a while now, that, you know, the presidential election is a, it's a shit show, you know, this has very little to, to do with uh, the well-being of the people, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, most uh, 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 campaigns are vanity campaigns, you know. Uh, these are ego-driven projects where you essentially have somebody positioning themselves as a savior to address whatever the ill might be. And they focus a lot on individuals, oligarchs, uh, the 1%, Wall Street, etc. Um, because in focusing on an individual, they can therefore claim that I will be the individual who's going to make the difference, right? Their focus is not on the system and their focus is not on you, you know? Um, so, you know, in realizing that the Socialist Party's National Convention was going to be coming up and the decision would have to be made, do we want to run a presidential campaign? Uh, and if so, what's it going to look like? Who's it going to be? That sort of thing. I talked to other friends in the Los Angeles local the Socialist Party um, and began to wonder, what happens if we take the idea of a presidential campaign and essentially flip it on its head? Um, and I'll explain this a little bit. As a radical organization, on a daily basis, mainstream media, generally, they're not knocking on our door to find out what we're doing on the day-to-day. -day. They don't give a fuck about us. Fine. We know that changes a little bit during a general election, during a presidential election. A lot of the pub public's attention is focused toward what's going on in the race, that sort of thing. So we knew that, you know, traditionally there is some media coverage and some mainstream media coverage uh, the presidential, presidential campaign. And we also anticipated uh, that with the inclusion of Bernie Sanders, who had called himself a democratic socialist, it's another issue. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we anticipated the possibility that there might be heightened media coverage because he was in the race. So the strategy was, can we use those media opportunities to discuss these ideas in an unapologetic way um, and use the space of the presidential campaign um, to allow the people, less the candidates, but the people a space to discuss, um, share their ideas, their stories, their feelings. In addition to that, um, as people, our hope was that as people saw these media pieces, and they did come, uh, you know, Vice featured the campaign, Univision did, the LA Times did, uh, 
Got more love from Telesurvey. Wait, you're that social. You're some socialist guy from Fox News, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Fox News. <laughs> you know, just you know. Um, That's amazing. And uh, <laughs> so the, the, those media pieces, they did come, and our hope was that once those pieces aired and we delivered this unapologetically radical message um, that was saying, "Don't look at us, the candidates." Let's look to one another, and let's try to build at the community level what we wanted to do. My running mate, Angela Nicole Walker, and I, um, and Angela, by the way, uh, was a socialist candidate for sheriff in Milwaukee in 2014. She actually got over 60,000 votes as a socialist. Um, she's just incredible. But we knew that if we spread this message using mainstream media, and now we're telling folks throughout this election cycle do not look at the candidates. This is a con, you know? Look to one another. Use this opportunity to build locally in your communities, you know? Um, and what we will do as candidates and through this campaign is to help in any way that we can uh, to help you build connections, right? So we expected that some people would respond with fear. Uh, particularly folks who've never been involved with radical politics before, um, that they might respond with fear. You know, the Cold War did happen. Uh, you know, and that propaganda about the Cold War, that was real. Uh, so there were folks who responded with fear. I'm interested, but I'm scared, right? Uh, so what we hope to do to kind of address those fears is using the campaign through social media, the website, etc. we use that space uh, to allow community organizers, activists, to tell their stories about what the work is like in, uh, at the local level, uh, in hopes of really humanizing this so that people throughout the country might be able to see themselves in the community organizers and activists. So we did that. Um, we knew that there would be folks who might be confused. You're telling us this is a presidential election you're telling us uh, we don't care how many votes we get, we're not worried about ballot access, uh, and you're telling us not to look at us. That's confusing, you know, like the institution of a, a, a presidential election is candidate focus. So this would open the door to a conversation about why we might say that. That's happened. It's required. We made a commitment to this at the beginning. What that has required is on a daily basis this is morning, noon, and night, that we avail ourselves, we make ourselves highly accessible to the people um, to have that dialogue. And if we can't do it all the time ourselves, folks within the campaign also make themselves available to have this conversation. And then finally, what we hoped was, was that people might reach out uh, uh, throughout the country and say, I want to get involved, but I have no idea where to go, right? So. Between Angela and I, and other folks within the campaign, and other folks within the Socialist Party, you know, we've got a large network of friends, activists throughout the country, uh, you know, who do what we could to help plug folks in locally with community work. It doesn't matter if they're a Socialist Party or not, you know, but help them plug them into community work so that they can get involved, and we wanted to help facilitate the building of that relationship. Um, and ultimately, the goal is not election day. It's not focused on election day. It's what's happened before and what will happen after election day. That's what makes the difference here, you know? So this is why we choose to run, you know? We understand this looks very different from what folks are used to, uh, and we're okay with that. And what we've been finding is, if you are present to have that conversation with folks, and if you package your messaging in very warm, inclusive, inviting language, the folks will respond. I know there's a lot of fear that, that, that folks have about involvement with revolutionary politics, but those fears can be addressed. And um, I think that the folks working with the campaign, some of them are here, do a really incredible job at presenting these ideas in a very warm, inclusive, inviting way, you know? We do a lot of listening. Key. Um, we do a lot of listening, and when we listen, 
we gather very important information about where people are at, where the individual is at. And with that information, we can build stronger relationships, you know? And I also think it's very important that folks feel valued, as they should, you know? Uh, one thing that we hear frequently within the campaign is, I can't, folks will say, I can't believe that you all as candidates, that you're having these conversations with me. And I think for Angela and I, if we couldn't do that, we wouldn't be the candidates to run, you know? Um, there was a, a, a man named Michael Leibowitz, who was on Hugo Chavez's transition team in Venezuela. And he wrote a book called The Socialist Imperative. And in that book, he explains how Hugo Chavez had asked him initially, how are we going to do this? How are we going to transition from capitalism to socialism? Michael Leibowitz said, none of this will be possible without the establishment of community. All of this lies on community, you know? We can run elections, we can get votes. Fuck, we, if a socialist president was elected into office, we still wouldn't see socialism. Now, this what would you do, nationalize the mines? Right. We have to build this from the community level and work its way up. It's inherently democratic, so it requires everybody's voice. It requires everyone's participation, you know? So, using a presidential campaign as one tool in a huge toolbox of weapons to fight the system, why not? You know, why not try something different? Um, try to do it in a very non-sectarian, very warm way, and uh, it's really been wonderful, you know? Uh, so, we try to keep that idea in mind when I mentioned about Michael Newport saying that you absolutely have to have community if you have any hope of establishing socialism, right? So that's why we're here. Before we move to this next stage here, and I think this is really what's going to be the critical stage, um, if anybody's any questions about this, feel free to ask. Uh, you know, uh, I've been happy to answer any questions you might have. Criticism, if you're like, you know, you're out of your fucking mind, whatever it might be. Uh, You're out of your mind. Who's going to pay it. for it? Who's yeah. <laughs> let it rip. So, does anybody have any questions about any of this? Does this make sense? Does this sound absurd? You know, anybody have anything? My campaign is brilliant. Oh, thank you so much. I've known several. I, I've talked to many people that said that they were probably the Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, My human uh, nature. I'm glad Val brought this up because one other thing that we decided to do is that we don't have a huge budget as a campaign, you know? Uh, the Socialist Party, not sure I, I, I couldn't be more, uh, uh, shit. I'd be honest with you when I tell you that it's a working class party. Um, and uh, we realized that we're not going to be able to travel everywhere throughout the country and meet folks face to face. We do so as we can. We have had visits in Denver, Philly, Lancaster, PA, uh, Thousand Oaks, California, Indianapolis, you know, uh, Pena, which is fucking rad. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, really <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just too fucking cool. Um, and uh, one thing we do, Val mentioned these town halls. Uh, <laughs> What we do is we host video town halls, uh, usually every other week that anybody throughout the country can join. Uh, we do this using a video conferencing platform. Uh, folks don't need a webcam to join. A lot of people call in by phone. And when we have these town halls, uh, as opposed to Angela and I you know, speaking about an issue and this is what we want to do, this is what we're going to do, blah, 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 bullshit. Um, they become essentially community discussions. So we might have a topic. We might have a topic of uh, intersectionality, uh, violence, whatever it might be, love, relationships. We have these town halls, and everybody speaks. Everybody shares ideas, um, and folks make connections. And 
start to build those relationships that I'm talking about, that will eventually lead to, ultimately, what we're talking about here is leading to strategic planning that identifies pressure points in the capitalist system, plans to attack those pressure points, and replace those pressure, pressure points with alternatives. Um, because that's what we're all ultimately here for. I mean, make a mistake. This is about revolution. I can get fiery with the rhetoric about re revolution, all that sort of thing. The truth is, to see progress, it requires a lot of work. And it requires strategic planning. That means communities coming together, identifying the issues within the system that they're facing, it, uh, these systems of oppression, patriarchy, you know, uh, climate change, whatever they might be, and planning how they're going to attack them, what success is going to look like, and how they're going to replace those systems once attacked with alternatives, you know. So that's what the goal is here, and we work on this every day. Uh, it may not be as sexy as sort of like some of the language that you hear coming out of presidential campaigns and all that sort of thing, but we're very serious about this idea of revolution, right? We, we're at a spot right now where we cannot afford to kick the rough can down the road any further. Um, you know, folks will bring up New Deal sort of shit, and the truth of the matter is, you know, we had a New Deal when we did. Hey, let's say capitalism. And, and well, here's the thing, you know, there were reforms that were implemented within the New Deal. Kept to, you know, decades later, income inequality is at an all-time high, union density is at an all-time low, and now with climate change, uh, you know, we're facing the reality that, uh, you know, we don't have a planet that we're going to be able to live on for much longer, right? We cannot afford another New Deal. Another thing, I mentioned this a second ago, um, you'll also find this in the Michael Leibowitz book, The Socialist Imperative. <coughs> Capitalism as a system, it needs reforms like the New Deal in order to maintain itself and in order to grow. So basically what happens is you have the system, you have capitalism, a roadblock comes up in the form of a reform, right? Some form of a New Deal, right? It's not a system change, it's a reform. As the system hits that reform, the system then strategically plans, it reformulates, and it figures out now stronger how to come, how to ascend, become more oppressive, to grow, right? Each time it hits the new reform, it's arising on the other end. Like I said, we talked about the New Deal, right? And all the all the reforms that were implemented there. Look where we're at right now, you know? So those reforms essentially will guarantee the continuation and the expansion of the system. Unless we're talking explicitly about the dismantling and overthrow of that system and the replacement of that system with a socialist system, we are fucked, right? And anybody who's telling you any different is conning you. And they have reasons that they might want to con you. It's politically expedient to con, con you, you know? It will feed into a vanity campaign to con you, you know? It might help them get votes to con you. But ultimately, for the sake of having a place to live, right? For the sake of the lives in our communities and communities throughout the world that are slaughtered every fucking day in the name of property protection, in the name of resource acquisition, they are conning those people. And I can only ask you, I have no interest in telling any of you what to do, but I can only ask you, please don't fall for the con. Please do look to one another for solutions. So, really that's the big message here, you know? It's like, I'm so grateful that you all are here to spend the time in this wonderful fucking space. I said to you before, like, in the city of Los Angeles, it's not like, you know, it's 10 million people in LA County. It's not like spaces like these are falling for me, you know? This is really fucking wonderful, you know? That you have a space like this to have discussions like this and to figure out how to address these problems. I mean, this is like a fucking miracle, you know? So, 
question. Uh, on that, on that note, doing it, trying to, uh, not even address those problems, but read the acknowledgement of those problems in a, in a community like this can be very disheartening. And so I wonder, approaching it on a national level and traveling, and I mean, you're obviously, you know, you're going to run into comrades and you're going to see people that that can keep you moving and make you realize that you're not alone in, in acknowledging those problems. But do you have, have you run into kind of an overwhelming reactionary force that has made you kind of like go to bed like, ah, shit. No, <laughs> not even, not even, no, not even close. And I'll tell you, in my opinion, not even close. And one of the reasons why I think is, look, we can acknowledge, you know, what we're up against. You know, the struggle is, is it's obviously profound, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I think we all see it sort of on social media, these proclamations of, you know, revolution now, blah, 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 right? Um, what we do, I think, in acknowledgement of how profound these challenges are, is we're realistic about what a victory looks like, you know? So, to me, I'm being completely sincere when I say this, the fact that tonight even happened, right? That's a fucking victory, you know? And I think to everyone, every person who's sitting in this room, you know, like, they're part of the fucking victory, you know? That's a big fucking deal. I mean, I look at things like that, you know? I look at a conversation where somebody says, I didn't think of that before, right? Where they might go from that spot, I don't know. I'll do my best thing I can to be part of, you know, their progression. But the fact that they might say that, that's a victory, you know? So I think sitting in this room tonight, this is like the fucking Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like, and while we're realistic about what we face, and absolutely the U.S. is, you know, it's an incredibly racist, conservative country, you know? And if we, you know, we should acknowledge how heartbreaking this is, you know? It is incredibly bleak. And we are so on the clock as far as, you know, we've got to get there like this, you know. However, I think in being good to ourselves, um, it's so important that we acknowledge those victories, you know. We say them out loud. We share them with one another, you know. I think it's okay to tell one another in these spaces, hey, you all fucking kick ass. And I'm so glad that you're here. And where it is that you might go from here makes me excited, you know? Um, and I think that's the way we approach all this, you know? So, like, you guys have done some really good like, social media to get a hold of people quite right. easily. Right. But I think one of the biggest problems is that, like, you can't necessarily rely on the mass media to tell everybody about all these like, technology and people. You don't know these problems are going on with all the skills and stuff. So how do you how do you tell the vast majority about what's really happening without having to rely on the mass media? How do you let people know? Because you can use social media, but there's still a huge wall. It's mostly like yelling about the people. Everyone thinks like they just watch TV and that's what they see. Whatever they see on TV, they go with. So how, do you, how do you get people to uh, think outside the box? How do you get the vast majority to think outside the box and say what they need to think the alternative, not how it's been? I think it's a really, really good question, and the answer to this uh, lies in an acknowledgement in how powerful you as an individual are, right? You have a sphere of influence, you know? You have the direct community um, that you interact with. You as a messenger, I've said this before, but like, you, you are an agent of change, right? Acknowledge how powerful you are as the individual, and that sphere of influence you are. You are part of the answer. You are, you are, you are, you are, right? So in each one of us, okay, the rest of you are, but. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> um, 
but <laughs> acknowledge how much power you have and acknowledge the impact that you have, right? So, look, we can look at mainstream media, we can acknowledge, holy fucking shit, they're on TV, they're on everybody's TV, you know, um, but we don't give the power away to them, you know? We don't let them control the narrative. We acknowledge how powerful we are, and we take advantage of that power, you know? So, you know, there's 20, 25 people in this room. Everybody here is capable of having an incredible impact, you know? So one more question. Sure. So I like how it starts as a conversation with a friend, and then it moves up to a new shop, and it plays a popular community. What's the next step? For who? For your whole building. What's the next step? Again? Sure. So, I had mentioned that for us, uh, you know, the focus is not election day, you know? The focus is what happens before and what happens after, you know? This whole process that I've been talking about, it doesn't stop on election day. We've been mindful of this for a long time. If it was focused on election day, we would have stopped a long time ago, you know? Uh, without letting, you know, cut out of that completely, uh, we will continue all of this and we're starting to set up a framework and a structure for continuing this whole thing and this whole approach and it builds by the day as far, you know, as far along as we were able to. Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, we want to continue this sort of uh, uh, process going until we do see the overthrow of capitalism. If that's 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, that's great, you know? Uh, but it's got to start now, you know? And uh, I think we're all in it for the long haul, you know? So this doesn't stop on election day. Uh, the town halls that I talked about, that doesn't stop on election day. Um, the help, the facilitation of relationship building throughout the country, that doesn't stop on election day. The traveling to meet people, and to have these kind of spaces where a dialogue can happen, that doesn't stop on election day, you know? What does stop on election day is any focus on Angela and I as candidates on a piece of paper, you know? That's really, you know, one of the more inconsequential pieces of this whole thing, you know? Uh, so, this isn't going to stop, you know? Essentially, this is sort of the beginning, you know? And this is trying to figure out how to put pieces Together, collect information. Like I said, a lot of this isn't as sexy um, as a lot of the rhetoric that you might see on TV, but it is done in a real sort of strategic planning. Collecting information, you know, um, analyzing an environment, assessing capacity, what sort of human capacity we have, identifying those pressure points within a system, and then how can we attack those points throughout the country, you know. So that, that's sort of what's happening. Does anybody else have any other questions, comments? When you refer to cons and reform, when I look at capitalism, I kind of find that those reforms, those cons, are intentional. Like a temporary solution. They're temporarily... It's like putting uh, a Band-Aid on an ulcer. Yeah. So I guess my question to you would be, how can we get around all these people making up these fake solutions so there had to be another reform to grow this system? Where are the permanent solutions well, to these problems? Those solutions lie with you and your community, you know? So you have this, do you live here in Pena? Yeah. No. Uh, did you come to Levi? Yeah. Okay. You have a community, right? Uh, you have issues that affect your community. Um, you also have you, you know? So collectively, uh, you as that group, those solutions lie with you. Now what we can do, I'm in contact with Levi, right, regularly. What we can do is we can coordinate and share information, right? So let's say there's another town in uh, California where uh, Lynn and I live. There's another town in California that's a relatively it's a similar size to your town, right? They're facing a similar sort of problem as you are. A similar, they've identified a similar point, uh, a pressure point within the capitalist system. We can share information, you know, and start to facilitate that process, perhaps swiften up the attack, you know? Uh, so 
communication, sharing information, but ultimately the focus is you, you know, in your community. The answer is, as far as we're concerned, they do not and they should not come from the top down, you know. I, this is me personally, I'm not really interested in hearing from a candidate what I'm going to do for you because they don't know what the fuck's up with my life, you know. They don't know what it's like to walk in my shoes. Um, you know, they don't live in my community, that sort of thing. You all live in your community. Nobody knows better what you're facing than you do, you know. So to hear from one source, this is what you should do, get the fuck out of here, you know. So this isn't a question, but maybe you could give everyone here some examples of, you know, what what people in the SP around the country are doing, like just some common sure. examples, for example, like what Greg's doing with his local in Montclair, what we do with the stuff that we okay. find coalition. Um, just thought this was what two nights ago. The Los Angeles Local and Socialist Party, we're part of a coalition called the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. It's based in Skid Row in Los Angeles. The coalition is predominantly made of folks in Skid Row, East LA, South LA, etc. And the goal of the coalition ultimately is the abolition of police. Uh, but what we do is we address surveillance from the LAPD, police brutality, oppression, etc. And we do so in, ver in, in couples substantive-based reporting with direct action. We're not seeking reforms, we're seeking solutions, right? So, for example, LAPD has been gifted two drones uh, from the Seattle Police Department. We, people, <coughs> have been able to keep those drones on the ground, right? They sit in the LA Inspector General's office. We occupied the mayor of Los Angeles' uh, front lawn, Mayor Garcetti, uh, to discuss the drones. He didn't come out to meet us, to speak with us, so what we did is we went Christmas caroling to all of the mayor's neighbors with Christmas carols about drones, and we handed them all information about the drone program. We do the same sorts of things with body cameras, with suspicious activity reports, Maybe many of you know now that the FBI has a program for high school students called uh, Preventing Violent Extremism, where they incentivize uh, the targeting of students who express themselves, uh, express interest in their culture, express anger in written word, in drawings. Uh, they target and they criminalize. We have a campaign right now where we want that campaign finished over in Los Angeles by a winter break. As I mentioned, the ultimate goal here is a revolutionary move. We want the abolition of the police. We will continue to fight until we see that abolition. But along the way, we see successes as we continue that march toward the abolition of police. You know, and I think it shows like, damn, what the fuck's possible in a community? You know, we're taking what is, you know, last year folks than any other city in the country. Of all the folks they killed, one third of them were mentally ill. Right. So this is a way to stand up to what is essentially a small army and say, no, you can't. And we're not going away. And ultimately, we want you gone, you know? Uh, we don't want to see a reformed police. We want you gone, you know? And we're very explicit with this. So I think an example of in a huge city, like what might be possible, you know? <coughs> this is not to suggest that it's easy, that it happens overnight, that there's not a lot of hard work that goes into this stuff, a lot of sacrifice. But it is possible, and it's possible because people like you, they get involved, you know? They, they make the difference. And I think everybody here, they have that power that make that profound change. And I think when we look at these, almost, I think you used the word before, it's almost like micro states, or these little cells. When we start to plug these together throughout the country, look the fuck out, you know? So we're looking at pain up right now, you know. Damn. Yeah, it wasn't pain up, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a cell, you know. <laughs> that's fun. Somebody shit themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Um, Stop it. Well, again, you know, this is not about, you know, like. Well, after this, we are holding a seance for the spirit of 